So, looks like it's time for yet another little spiel about non-duality. Whatever that is. I don't know what it is. I don't think anyone knows what it is. If anyone knows what this is, as you know, in terms of concepts, then basically what they've done is they've started up a new religion or, you know, a belief system or something. So it's basically just concepts strung together and believed by an imaginary entity. That's what this whole dilemma is about. It's about taking on taking concepts on board as real instead of seeing concepts as what they are. Charlie Hayes had a great interview with or podcast with uh, John Wheeler, and yeah, they really get to the bottom of that whole you know menu, you know eating the menu instead of the meal sort of thing. This that's basically what's happening in religious and spiritual circles who have concrete sort of made a concrete plan or a, a layout of what they think the truth is and then have taught it to others and are attempting to help others to see it in in this way from this angle in exclusion to something else it's very very simple this is this is too simple and being an intellectual can tend to make it very complicated that this whole you know, finding the truth or seeing the truth or whatever it is, whatever we call it. It, it has nothing to do with concepts at all. It's about seeing things the way they are without needing an overlay, without needing to put extra stuff between, for example, me and the world or me and reality. There is no me and reality. There is just reality. There's no me and the world. There is just oneness appearing as a body and a world. So it's just, it's, it's the way it's al always been. When I say it's always been, that implies a past. It's the way it is now. And then and there's no and then. See, that's the whole problem with the search. The search is an and then, you know. So it's I'm me, and then I need to do something to feel better, you know. The core delusion of I'm a me, I'm, I'm a self, separate from everything else. I'm a separate entity who needs to, who needs to either do something, to be something better, to obtain something, to learn something. I need something. I'm someone who needs something. And here's a world that can or might provide me with something. It better. <laughs> the world better work. Or I'm going to be mad. You know, it's just, it's a very basic thing. But the intricacy and the, the huge nature of this concept, as it builds and builds throughout the, the body's lifetime, it's huge. It, it seems huge. It, it becomes experientially so all-encompassing, this me idea, this self-center that is so, it's so prevalent. You see, you see the sort of effects, the manifestations of it. You see it in everything. You know, my car, my this, my that, my, my wife, my husband. Everything is imbued with a me and mine quality. And it's, and see, that sounds like a judgment saying, this is bad, you know, we shouldn't be self-centered, or self-centeredness is bad, or this is all wrong. It's not wrong, it's not bad. But it is false. It's not real. But it's not. It's not morally wrong. See, the the religious standpoint is generally about. It says certain behaviors or actions or belief systems are wrong. But what they're not getting to the root of. Is where these are coming from. Where the sort of destructive actions are coming from. See, they're focusing on the manifestation, but they're not getting back to the root. You know, Jesus spoke directly to the root. I'm guessing, I've never met the man. <laughs> but I'm guessing he was trying to communicate something that was inexpressible. But then, of course, people misinterpreted that and captured it and churned it up into a, a mind-based doctrine, you know, in the Bible. Or, and then it was revised and new, new editions of the Bible came out and different interpretations. The ones who are in charge of religions 
generally do not live the understanding that, say, Jesus or the Buddha or whatever had, had, didn't have it. But see, it's, that's just the way it is. I mean, the insanity that's generated out of religion and different spirituality and, and all that type of thing is self-evident. It's self-evidently insane. So the people looking at it can see, oh, well, this is crazy. You know, all these rules to follow and the notion of being separate in the first place, you know, being separate from God or separate from the Buddha nature or whatever string of sounds you hang on, nothing. It's just, the whole thing is so convoluted and wrapped up in irrelevancies that it's, it becomes inaccessible because there's imaginary barriers, but they are imaginary. And this is what, this, the living, uh, I think Wayne Lickerman calls it the living teaching, which is actually becoming quite common now, not universal, but more common. People that are actually investigating this self-center and sort of seeing through it, and then the response comes to communicate about the, the seeing, you know, because there's a, a clear seeing of the nature of this dilemma, and there's sort of a response that that says, you know, there, there's no need for this suffering. There's no need for this self-inflicted suffering. And, you know, Jesus says, "My cup run." Or in the Bible, it said, "My cup runneth over," which is sort of the pointer of. You could call it. I think Adya Shanti calls it a, a transpersonal concern. So it's a seeing that we're all sort of in this together, even though there's only oneness. There's the appearance that we're all in this sort of dilemma together of self-inflicted suffering and sort of this perpetual cycle. So there's a seeing that there, that cycle can be broken simply by seeing that there's no one in it. So it's a simple investigation back into the claims of the mind that started happening at a young age of the organism. And see, it's just looking in and seeing that there's no one central in this drama. You know, there's characters moving around a stage, boop, 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 just going through their little script. But there's no one making that happen. And the seeing of that is the freedom from someonehood. So it's the freedom from being a self. But there's no one who is free. There is just freedom. And I am, I am that. So are you. And everything else is that. If that's not seen, it's still that, but experientially, it won't be apparent. It'll, it, will, it will be as though there's a separate suffering someone if this isn't seen. So it is important that this is seen, because otherwise there's just endless seeking. So it's kind of a paradox, because in one way it's completely irrelevant, because everyone is that already so there's no problem but from the perspective of the seeker it's a huge it's an all-encompassing problem it's it's absolutely important and it's absolutely relevant that this is seen so it's just a simple matter of continuing the investigation not continuing it as a process see this is the this is the paradox the investigation can happen although there's no one doing it so the encouragement is only from oneness to oneness, saying, investigate. Because there is only oneness anyway, so the whole thing is moot in that. But if it doesn't seem to be moot, if there seems to be an, a real issue here, it's just the simple investigation to investigate consciousness investigating consciousness. And that's all there is, really. So it's already this. See, this isn't very entertaining. This isn't this isn't sort of flashy spirituality. This isn't explosions and fireworks and visions and all that. It's just simplicity. So this is not going to be popular, you know. It's just some scruffy-looking kid in a university dorm room talking about a nothing, a nothingness. It's not a nothingness. It's just this. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Thanks a lot for listening, and feel free to write, and I love you.